Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, first of all. I'm honored to have been asked. Right, empathy over apathy. You know, very important words. Empathy is a particularly important one because empathy is what stops you from doing bad things to other people a lot of the time. Or it's what makes you learn the lesson when you do do the bad things to other people for a particular time. You know, guilt's a something, as they say. Right, um, I thought I'd start with this poem. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man, every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a club be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. Just look at Brexit, after all. As well as if a prominent tree were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. You see, the problem with this poem is that quite a few people actually misinterpret it because you'll probably know the first line and the last two, and that's it. You know, no one ever really sort of thinks about the middle of anything nowadays, you know. You see, no man is an island entire of itself. We tend to think that means, you know, we can't always do things on our own for ourselves, and we will have to ask for help. So if you have a look, is that, look, I am involved in mankind. We are all interconnected. We are all part of a greater something that binds us and ties us all together. You know, be it your family, be it your real family, your friends, you know, be it your doctor, your boss, you know, your employer. You know, there's six degrees of separation, as they say, or as film buffs use, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. What we learn from this is something that is often forgotten in our modern society. Um, and I'm going to take you back now to 1994 which was a fantastic year, as you can see. It was the year we got the Channel Tunnel, it was the year we got the National Lottery, and it was the year we got the Vicar of Dibley. You know, great show, great show. <laughs> uh, now, in that year, we also got something else. Uh, that was called Cash for Questions. Um, anyone in here who will admit to being over the age of 25 probably knows about it. It was when Mohammed Al-Fayed confessed to um, charging Basic, well, sorry, charging, paying for um, MPs to, should we say, ask particular questions for him on topics that were close to his heart. For, I believe it was 500 quid a pop for asking a question. And of course, John Major's government at the time was, had had several scandals already. So they set up the Nolan Commission. And the Nolan Commission came up with these seven principles of public life. Now, I've worked in the public sector in various guises for my sins. A lot of them, my sins. These are like the first page of the first job description that they will give you. They are the first thing on the induction that they will give you. You know, it's when they're still pretending that they're actually a resident-focused, say, council, instead of a customer-focused organization. And I hate that term for citizens of any, any country who are being dealt with by any element of their government. We are not customers. It implies that there is a buy and sell relationship between us. And that's what got Mohammed al fayed and the rest of them in trouble in the first place with the cash for questions. So these are our seven principles, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. Okay? All of these get ignored from the minute you're out the door from your orientation. That's it, they're gone. You don't really tend to see these anymore in your day-to-day -day jobs in the public sector. They aren't something that are referred to. And if you refer to them in meetings, which I did do a couple of times, um, when I think back now, I realize what it is. It's that you know, you're sort of poking at what little of their conscience and humanity manages to make it past 9 a.m. in the morning when they get into work and you know, is returned to them at 5 p.m. that evening when they leave. Now, of these seven, the one that I hated the most, because it was the one that was misused the most, in my opinion, was objectivity. Holders of public office must act and shall take decisions impartially, fairly, and on merit, using the best evidence and without discrimination or bias. Utter, utter, utter nonsense. Because how are you going to take a decision without discrimination or bias? You know, when the decisions that you are taking involve, say, children who need to be taken into care, 
Of course you've got to be bloody biased for that. You know, you are taking a child away from parents who are being cruel or an environment where it's being cruel. So, of course, you've got to show emotion. You've got to really care about this subject. It can't just be a case to you. You know, if it's an old person who needs personal care, it's the same thing. You've got to actually care about your job. And, you know, there are very few, sadly, vocational social workers, vocational um, you know, care workers and things like that left in these industries now because they're not the ones that are wanted. Because, you see, they don't leave their objectivity at the door. And by objectivity, what, what they're really saying is do what your boss says and keep your mouth shut. Don't make any waves, don't make any complaints because you'll be seen as problematic. You know, and in civil service speak, problematic is a death sentence. No one wants to be problematic. It's almost like being imaginative. You know, they don't like it whatsoever. So from there, <clears throat> we have these two pictures which I thought emphasized the point I wanted to make. And it's not so much what the pictures show, it's what they don't. Because this one over here was taken on the Friday after the fire. So we are talking three days later, two, three days later after the Grenfell fire. And I was outside a job center. No, I wasn't there. To, I, I, wasn't signing on at the time, but I had to go to a job center, and I should have been at the rescue center registering as an evacuated resident from Lancaster West Estate, but I wasn't. The second one was the two-week anniversary, so the 21st of June, and instead of being uh, on some of the memorial events that were happening at the time, I was learning rather crappily how to use Photoshop, as you can see. I, I have got better. I really have. I should have been with my neighbors. If I was being pragmatic, I would be there. You know, if I was being compassionate, I'd be doing what I was doing at those. And I'll come back to them later as well. Next now, we have this favorite quote of mine. This is from Yes Minister. And it's Bernard Woolley, who is the, uh, sec uh, the private secretary to the minister, feels guilty because he's being asked to lie in some minutes that he's asked to write for a meeting. And he goes to his boss and he says, I don't want to be, do this. I'd like to have a clear conscience. And that is Sir Humphrey's reply. A clear conscience? When did you acquire this taste for such luxuries? Yeah, and this is how it's treated in the public sector. It's seen as a luxury to have a clear conscience. You know, because they try to pretend that every decision they're taking is the one like Churchill took, allegedly, when it came to the bombing of Coventry during World War II, because the story goes, and we're not exactly sure if it's true or not, but the story is that because they'd broken the Nazi codes, they knew that Coventry was going to be bombed quite heavily. And so he had a choice. He could either evacuate Coventry and let the Nazis know they'd broken the Enigma code, and so they'd lose all of the communications, or they could let Coventry explode with all the people there and keep this secret. And allegedly, he chose the latter option in order to end the war quicker. You know, people in a council who basically can't arrange a carer for someone one night will try and pretend that their decision is of that import. And they're making these sorts of decisions on a purely pragmatic basis when it's not. It's because they don't really care about the job. It's because, you know, there's too much pressure on them from the bosses. And it's because uh, if they do try and do the right thing, they are seen as problematic and they'll be out the door. You know? Now, individual cases will be dealt with individually. Uh, everyone in my part of the estate had been promised 500 pounds because we'd all been basically ran out of our properties and hadn't been allowed back, and this was to cover expenses that we had, you know, like food and clothes and living in general. Um, all of a sudden then, despite Theresa May announcing this and it being on the government's website, RBKC, Kensington and Chelsea Council, charming people, they decided that 500 pounds was too much arbitrarily and they weren't going to give it. And they were giving single people 270. So again, I should have been on my way somewhere to actually deal with sort of treatment and, you know, mourning and grieving. And I had to phone up the, someone at the Westway and tell them to hand the phone to one of the Kensington and Chelsea staff and I basically shouted at them down the phone and I bullied them into giving my neighbor the money because he was the first one that they weren't going to do. And I pointed out at the time that I was on my way to the Victoria Derbyshire show. And that really seems to, you know, focus hearts and minds in these places. And I'll come back to why in a moment. Now, individual cases will be dealt with individually. 
was a great line that was given to me by a, a lady I will call Julie, because that was her name. Now, I'd gone down there when I'd found out that morning uh, that uh, when I was registering, the person next to me from one of the other blocks, he said to me, I've got to go, I can't wait here, I've got to sign on. So I said to him, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you my phone, ring them and tell them, like, surely they can't expect you to sign on today. And he said, no, they've told me this already, I rang them this morning, they said, if I don't come down, I could be sanctioned. So I was that outraged that I said to him, look, you wait here. I said, I'll go to the job centre now because I'm fine with this. Uh, and I said, I'll bet you something. I said, you won't have to sign on. And if you do, I'll give you your money, your sign-on money. Um, so I walked down there. Uh, I go in. I, on the way, I'd gone on royalmail.com, and I got myself all the postcodes that I needed for everywhere on Lancaster West Estate, every single one of them. And I said to them, could you please waive these postcodes for me? you know, so that they don't have to sign on to, uh, today or, you know, until the end of June, perhaps. And they went away, and then they came back, and they said to me, uh, but Mr. Delaney, you don't sign on, do you? So why are you here? And at that point, I was like, are you serious? I'm here because I'm a human being, and this is cruel. And also, it's technically a lie, because you ask these people, how, you know, have they been actively seeking work? Well, unless they were seeking work, you know, as emergency responders in the last 12 hours, no, they weren't because they were fleeing a burning building, you know, or being evacuated from buildings that were at risk of collapse. And I went down there. There were three ladies at the DWP desk. I use that term loosely. And I explained the situation to them. And one of them said, were you just in my job center? I just told you no on the phone. Really exasperatingly. And I, I actually said it to her. It's like, how can you do this? Like, you can't, you can do blanket. She's like, we can't do blanket waivers. And she was like, no, no, but trust me, you know, we, we will deal with these things compassionately. And that was when she said it. Individual cases will be dealt with individually. And I sincerely hope those words haunt that woman. I really do, because I said something that quite a few people, when they're dealing with the might of a bureaucracy, say, and usually it goes nowhere. I said, I'm going to the media about this. And all three of them actually laughed, and I believe one of them said, good luck. But the problem was, there were live TV cameras right outside the place. So I was on BBC News at 1 within 15 minutes, and on ITN News within 25, and on Channel 4 within about an hour. And I repeated this story over and over, and her quote. And that day then, the minister for Grenfell, Nick Hurd, popped out and said, no, 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 we wouldn't do this. Of course, they're allowed not to sign on. And then the next day, the DWP itself issued a statement, because he didn't have the power, and they said they have clarified to their staff that, of course, these people shouldn't be asked to sign on, and that they won't be now until the end of the year, which was surprisingly better than we thought it would be. It was a hell of a lot better, in fact. Would we have thought that when Morbick was appointed on the 28th of June, 2017? No, we wouldn't, because he came. I was in the first group that met him at 10 a.m. that day, he came and he sat with us and he listened to our concerns and what we wanted looked at and he nodded and said yes. And then he went out and gave an interview to the media and he said, no, I can't see any of what they're asking for being in my remit. And his remit hadn't even been agreed at that point because the Prime Minister has to agree it. But, you know, it does show you that already arguments were being framed. Uh, so we basically had to hold his feet, you know, uh, over the coals, as it were and make sure that he realized that this isn't just about what he's being told to do by the establishment. It's also about what he's uh, got to do in terms of his legacy. Because you see, again, you appeal to the person rather than the issue. And I said to him, you know, you should be like McPherson. You know, that gave us institutional racism. You can give us institutional indifference. And I do hope he uses the phrase, because I do think it sums it up quite well. It's not objectivity, it's indifference that we face on all of these times. Why are politicians the way they are? Why do they lie? Why do they steal? Why do they cheat? Why do they tell outrageous lies on TV and get away with it? Whose fault is it? Whilst we don't hold them to account, they are literally unaccountable. And look what unaccountability does. You know, it gives us some awful behavior. You know, we end up with a President Trump. You know, and I can't be politically biased. So, I would urge everyone to visit .gov.uk forward slash register dash to dash vote. Or if you want something quick, remember each politician works for you. So picture who it is you're voting for. Bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y, I work for you. You know, get out, you can register to vote right now and you can ask for a postal vote as well.
You see, so it's all done for you. And you even get a prepaid envelope to send it back in. So, you know, if you don't vote, don't ever complain about anything, ever. Ever. Because every element of your life is affected by these people. And if you aren't picking these people, you are part of the problem and you are enabling them. And in the same way that a bad parent enables a spoiled child. You know, so you have no one to blame but yourselves. And, you know, you really need to start listening and also start talking to each other and to them. Thank you very much.